Welcome to Theology for the Broken Church with the Broken Vessels podcast. Jeremiah 18.4 states, And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to do. This is the Broken Vessels Podcast. I'm your host, Joshua Simpkins. This is a podcast where we have discussions on theological themes for the broken to bring encouragement and hope in Christ. And I would like to welcome you back to the Broken Vessels podcast, and this is our first, I guess you would say, somewhat inaugural episode of Theology for the Broken Church with Josh and Brad. You all remember I had uh, my friend Brad Kafer on a couple of weeks ago, or a few weeks ago, and we are starting this up, and we're going to talk about Theology for the Broken Church. And so, Brad, welcome back. Yeah, thank you, Josh. I'm excited to be doing this with you. Um, like you said, this is our first episode of Theology for the Broken Church, and we are just really excited to be doing this together. Very much so. Well, what we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about a certain passage of Scripture and a certain kind of ideology and theology to a certain degree of a, a hermeneutic that is placed upon this certain passage that we believe brings really a lot of brokenness to people and is very confusing and very much flies in the face of the law gospel distinction. Brad, just for the listeners, if you could talk about, as we do this on a monthly basis, and you've explained it very well as we've talked off air, but our overarching kind of dynamic or hermeneutic or theme is very much law gospel distinction focused. Can you kind of speak to that just a little bit, just so that the listeners understand when we're talking, that that is kind of undergirding what we're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. You know, Martin Luther said, whoever can distinguish law and the gospel should thank God for he is a theologian. And the law gospel as a distinction, as a hermeneutic, that was really the key to the Reformation. You know, whether you're Reformed or Lutheran, um, this is sort of the Protestant understanding of Scripture, that there's a law and there's the gospel, that the law is good and holy, but it cannot save. It can only show us our need for Christ. And then the gospel is the good news of what God has done for us in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so properly distinguishing between the law and the gospel is foundational to our growth and the Christian life. It's foundational to understanding how to live as Christians and where do we place our hope. The undergirding principle of our podcast is that the law gospel distinction informs everything. And then that overarching implication is that we believe that confusion and conflation of law and gospel is going to bring brokenness and rightly distinguishing law and gospel is, is a key part of the healing journey that we go on in Jesus. Exactly. And as you all know, you know, I did a whole podcast talking about the law gospel distinction. Can't remember which guest I had on. It was either Justin Perdue or Pat Abendroth, but both of those guys talked about it when uh, when they were on. And this is a very important category when it comes to looking at the Word of God and understanding the Scriptures and placing those things, law and gospel, covenant of works, covenant of grace, all of these things in their proper contexts so that we can really understand the historic reformed understanding of scripture and really what we believe i would posit is the new testament understanding the thing that we want to talk about is the whole idea of the narrow gate in the narrow way. I'm going to read the passage from Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 27, just to kind of get us going on this conversation, Brad. I'm going to go ahead and read the passage, and then if you want to come in and kind of talk about how this passage can be misused or misrepresented, and really how, especially in the American evangelical church, how we personally have heard it and seen it misrepresented. And we're going going to posit that there is an alternative to that, which we believe is figured out from a better hermeneutic and from a more historical reform perspective. 
So I'm going to read uh, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 27, and it starts. Enter, and this is Jesus talking, by the way, in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came And the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Now, Brad, this passage can be very confusing to people. It can, especially uh, when we try to apply it immediately to our own context. If we could kind of discuss talking about how we've seen this passage misused, I'm going to go ahead and let you talk about that, and then I'll kind of chime in as we go. Yeah, so we see this passage and others twisted out of context, especially in the American church today. And some of the ways that it gets twisted is that the immediate context is ignored, Right. Who is Jesus speaking to in this text? And then in the broader, it's in the Gospel of Matthew. So we need to take into account why was Matthew written? What was the purpose of this piece of literature? And who is the primary audience of Matthew's Gospel? So we have the context within the literature. Who is Jesus speaking to and why? What's his purpose and audience? And then Matthew's purpose and audience. And if we ignore that, we're already uh, setting ourselves up for a, a misreading of the text. Because while there are obviously implications for us, as there is with all scripture, right? It's God breathed, it's profitable for instruction and teaching, so we can be wise for salvation. But if we miss the immediate context, then we will draw the wrong conclusions and not have the proper implications for a personal application in our lives today. And so that's what I would argue, and I know you agree with this, Josh, that what we frequently see in the church today is an ignorance around the context, the purpose, and the audience of Jesus and Matthew. And the only context that we pay attention to is our immediate modern American context. And so we sort of take these verses out of their redemptive historical setting and the purpose for which they are written down, and we apply them to ourselves without uh, that proper context. And so what that ends up doing is we misread Jesus, mm-hmm. and there's a principle, uh, the, the Articles of Religion, Article 20 says that the church should not expound one place of scripture repugnant to another. And so my perception and perspective would be that the way that this is frequently taught in modern evangelicalism does expound it in a way repugnant to other parts of the scriptures and that we would want to correct that. So there's a lot of things that could be discussed as far as the different themes and elements within this text. But for this episode, we're really wanting to focus on the whole number of the elect. So Jesus says, you know, many are on the road to destruction, but narrows the the gate and narrows the way that leads to life and few there be that find it. So we have like this many and the few. And a lot of times what happens is preachers focus on the few and that it becomes a scare tactic where they extrapolate from that text that the whole number of the elect considered throughout all times and places and considered in the eschaton in the end is only a small number of humans will be saved in the end by Jesus. Right. The vast majority of humans will be in hell. So you might say something like there'll be more in hell than in heaven. Right. And then by extension, there are more unbelievers or unregenerate members in the visible church than regenerate 
members. And so that's a false teaching. And one of our desires in this episode is to explore that and bring to bear the true teaching of Scripture and the Reformed tradition, which is that the whole number of the elect is an innumerable multitude and that there will be more in heaven than in hell and kind of make that case. There's a whole kind of web of teaching connected to this idea that's within this text. And so, you know, in a sense, you start kind of pulling on the thread and it all starts to unravel. So we're going to be talking a little bit about some of those other implications and how things like the Galatian heresy and pietism can come into play as well. Yes. We're going to kind of narrowly focus on this one theological point. Is the elect small in number or great in number? And we're going to show how a misreading of the text leads to a false teaching, which is the elector few. But as we then discuss the right way to read it, it's going to bring in all of this other things like context, hermeneutics, redemptive historical reading of scripture, covenantal theology, reform confessions. Right. And for those of you that, just so you know, when me and Brad talk, we're going to be using theological terms that some of you may not be familiar with. Hermeneutics, it's not some dude's name, Herman Nudics. <laughs> that was a joke back in Bible college. Good old Herman Nudics. No, hermeneutics is just biblical interpretation is what we're talking about. So when we're talking about hermeneutics, whether it be bad or good, we're talking about how we come at Scripture and we interpret Scripture. Okay, And some of what Brad talked about, he's really speaking to the fact that many times what the evangelical church has done, and this even happens in so-called reform circles, they have bad hermeneutics to some degree. And then biblicism, which we've talked about biblicism on this program, where it's taking a verse or a passage out of its context, out of its historical context, and even out of its immediate context, and applying it in a way that is not appropriate. Okay, And there's a lot of controversy over biblicism, like what biblicism is and all of that. But really, what we're talking about is when you are taking a passage of scripture, like Brad said, out of its historical context, you're not taking authorial intent into consideration, as well as everything else that goes with that, like Brad said, the audience that he is immediately speaking with. It's real easy for us to try to take every part of Scripture and try to apply it to us in this modern day individually. Uh, we got to be really, really careful about doing that, especially when it comes to narrative passages, especially when it comes to like even the Old Testament. We just have to be very, very careful in the way that we do that because it can really get us off. It can take us to places that bring us into bad theology and bad doctrine, Mm -hmm. which again, and we're going to be bringing in some historical reform people as far as their interpretations quotes you know the history of the church there's a lot of denominations out there that'll tell you well that's all a bunch of hogwash and um, you don't need confessions you don't need creeds you don't need to be reading that's what the catholic church does they just care about tradition Uh, well no that's not the case tradition and reading theologians from thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago, that's important because it helps us to understand where the church has come in the way that they've understood these passages. Many of you probably have heard this passage preached, Mm -hmm. and when you've heard it preached, you've heard it applied to us as Christians immediately in the immediate context or immediate application, we would argue that that's not who Jesus is talking to in this passage. Brad and I talked earlier today. I listened to a sermon from a pretty well-known preacher, somebody that is even sometimes labeled as being Reformed. He's a Baptist, and he preached this, and it was very disconcerting to me because of the way that it was kind of ripped out of its context and the way that it was misapplied to us as believers. As Brad said, it can be misapplied in a sense in which it's used in a way that is used like a scare tactic to Mm -hmm. basically make you doubt your salvation, to really steal away the assurance of the church. And there's so many implications that come into play when we do these kinds of things, when pastors do this, because it can cause so much hurt and so much brokenness to a person where they're just going to be ready to just give up and walk away altogether because they're like, I can't do it. 
I can't follow the narrow way. Now, the way that I heard this preached was enter by the narrow gate, and he related the narrow gate to being Jesus. Well, yeah, that's true. But his application was, you will know them by their fruits. And if you're not showing enough fruit, which is very ambiguous, very ambiguous, Mm -hmm. if you're not showing enough fruit, and if you're not walking along the narrow way, along with going through the narrow gate, then that's just evidence that you were never saved in the first place. That is very much how this passage has been preached over and over and over again. And I can guarantee you, a lot of you have probably heard that. How does that make you feel? Well, you're thinking to yourself, I'm going to go to heaven and I'm going to say, Lord, Lord, when I get to heaven and he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you, you worker of lawlessness. And you're going to apply this building your house on the rock and the sand. I mean, I can remember as a kid uh, singing the song, uh, the wise man built his house upon the rock, the foolish man built on the sand. These are ways in which this passage is not applied properly. And we're going to posit to you how it should be applied. And really, I hope as we have this discussion, it's going to bring you actually encouragement. We should not be reading the Gospel of Matthew and be fearful as Christians. We should be reading the Gospel of Matthew as Christians and be encouraged that Christ has saved us. Amen. I would like to jump in there with that as well, sure. Josh. And to go back to the whole idea of taking it out of context, what that ends up doing is it's actually a form of pride because it elevates our own importance and centrality yeah. to the narrative while denigrating God's word as this historical literature inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's primarily about Jesus. And then we need to understand the, the redemptive history historical narrative and art of the Bible so we understand our place in that. Right. What you're saying as well, when you're talking about the narrow gate and the narrow way, that often gets twisted into a kind of Galatian heresy. Yes. So the narrow gate becomes faith in Christ, but the narrow way becomes going on to perfection by the flesh. So real quick, explain to the listeners, what do we mean when we say the Galatian heresy? So the Galatian heresy is, Paul says, having begun by the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? So the Galatian heresy is all about reintroducing the law or the old covenant for salvation. Right. So you've already placed your faith in Christ, but these false teachers come along and say, but to really be saved, to really follow Jesus, to really be holy, you have to follow Moses as well. You have to be circumcised and follow the ceremonial and dietary laws of the Torah. So if you want to follow Jesus, you have to be under the law. And the whole book of Galatians is written in this just really polemical tone where Paul's saying, who has bewitched you? You foolish Galatians, like, don't you know Jesus set you free from the law? in this way and you are no longer under that schoolmaster you're no longer in that slavery don't submit to that yoke of slavery don't accept circumcision don't believe these people who are telling you jesus plus obedience jesus plus the law is how you end up being saved in the end we don't start by faith in christ by the power of the spirit and then go on by keeping the law in our own strength and that's often how this passage gets turned into something akin to that. Right. That we we start by trusting Christ alone, but the way we continue in the Christian life is not by faith in Christ, but by keeping the law. And usually some kind of progressive sanctification narrative that means more and more keeping of the law. And like you said, it really distorts the lines of what does it mean to keep the law and what is acceptable before God. But it functionally, and here's the main problem, it functionally puts believers back under a covenant of works and turns sanctification into a threat instead of a promise. And so people live with a lack of assurance. People live in fear. And instead of living with confidence in the one who loved me and gave himself for me, I live in fear that I'm not keeping the law adequately or that I'm not going to keep it good enough to the end. So it takes away the believer's assurance because it it reintroduces the idea of human performance for ultimate uh, justification. Another passage that a lot of people will take, and they'll kind of counter what we're saying, and they'll say, well, Matthew 22, the parable of the wedding feast, Jesus says, many are called, but few are chosen. Number one, taking that one verse, Matthew 22, 14, and just ripping it completely out of its context, 
and and the parable that he's trying to teach people with is a really bad misuse of scripture. So people take that and they say many are called, few are chosen. So how would you respond to somebody when they throw that at you in this discussion? Well, I think it'd be a good time to start discussing what is the purpose of Matthew's gospel and who is the audience of both Matthew and Jesus. Right. So let's go ahead and talk about how we believe that this passage should actually be interpreted. Part of the reason we're talking about this today is because Brad had somebody posit this question on Facebook. And then at the same time, it was interesting. I had a friend that was asking me the same thing. And then we talked about this and Brad gave a really, really good explanation of this that was very coherent and really very well done. And he's not the only one. There's guys like B.B. Warfield and C.H. Spurgeon and many others that we have some things that we're going to share with you in a little bit later that's going to help to kind of undergird what we're saying. But Brad, go ahead and give the explanation of how this should really be interpreted. So we're looking at Matthew's gospel. Matthew, most scholars believe, and it makes a lot of sense, that Matthew is written to the Jews. So the purpose of Matthew's gospel is not merely to inform the objective facts of Jesus's life, although it does that, right? Like Jesus Christ is historical man. He was incarnate of the Holy Spirit, the Virgin Mary, and became man for us and for our salvation. So we do get an accurate record, a trustworthy account of Jesus's life and ministry, but the gospel is literature. It's written to persuade. So a main thrust of Matthew's gospel is that he is writing to the Jews to persuade them that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ. Right. And it's no accident, in my opinion, that Matthew is the first book of the New Testament because he's looking back at the Old Testament, which all the apostles do. And Jesus himself taught us that we read the Old Testament logically. But Matthew's looking back at these scriptures and proving from the scriptures that the Christ is Jesus, which is the main heart of apostolic preaching in the book of Acts, for example. But because that primary audience is Jewish people, there's going to be a little bit different angle than, say, maybe Luke or John. And so Matthew records a lot of Jesus's interactions with the Jews, and he records the biggest chunk of the Sermon on the Mount. The whole end of Matthew's gospel, where that text comes out, many are called, few are chosen. Jesus is speaking to the scribes and Pharisees and religious leaders extensively through several chapters. And so once we understand that there is this Jewish context, a Jewish audience, and the purpose is to persuade Jews that Jesus is indeed the Christ, then we can begin to make sense out of what Jesus is saying. So if we look at apostolic preaching, for example, in the book of Acts, they interpret Deuteronomy 18.15 as being about Jesus. That is where Moses says, after me, the Lord will raise up one like me. You shall listen to him. And Simeon sang when Jesus was presented at the temple that he was appointed for the rise and fall of many in Israel. If we understand redemptive history, when Jesus comes on the scene, he is appointed for the rising and fall of many in Israel. These religious leaders, Jesus rebukes over and over again. You search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life, but you will not come to me that you may have life. He uses Isaiah's prophecy, Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah is going to preach, but the people are going to become dull and hardened and not respond. And we see this in Paul's theology too, Romans 9 to 11, is the Jews as a corporate entity, as a theological category, as a people reject the Christ. So John says in his gospel, he came into his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him who believed on his name, to them he, he gave the right to be children of God. So my understanding of redemptive history is that Israel, according to the flesh, failed in their purpose. And this, they didn't fail from the, the Abrahamic covenant standpoint. Through their race came the Christ. So God faithfully brought Christ through the Jewish nation according to his promise and prerogative. But the Jews, as considered from the stipulations of the Mosaic Covenant and what they were supposed to do and be about, failed to bring about the kingdom of God and the righteousness of God. And according to Paul's theology in Romans 9 through 11, as well as just apostolic preaching in general, the Jews are about to be broken off of the covenant community, the Abrahamic olive tree of blessing, and Gentiles are going to be grafted in. So Matthew's gospel is full of warnings that the axe is laid to the root 
that mm-hmm. you think you have Abraham as your father, that the vineyard is going to be taken away from you and given to others. So there's this whole idea of most ethnic Jews are going to reject the Christ and be cut off. Well, only a few will be saved. Yes. So once you understand that, then the few doesn't mean the whole number of the elect through all times and places, but only a few of ethnic Israel is going to believe upon Christ, a remnant chosen according to grace, and the rest are hardened and broken off. And so John the Baptist and Jesus, they're warning the people, don't say you have Abraham for your father. Just because you come from this lineage of Abraham, according to the flesh, that means nothing Mm. when you reject the Messiah and unbelief. Right. And so Jesus is speaking to a context, to a group of people whom he knows will primarily reject him. And so he's warning them, saying, don't be among the many, be among the few who believe. It's very important then. When you guys come to this passage, and really the whole Sermon on the Mount, understand who is the audience. Brad, who's the audience in Matthew chapter 7? It's it's the Jews again. Right. Jesus has gone up on the mountain like Moses. It's almost like a a Deuteronomy experience. Yes. It's the greatest sermon on the law. Yeah. Exactly. So Moses gave the law at Sinai and Exodus. And then before they go into the land, he gives the law again. Deuteronomy means like second law. So right. he's giving the law again to the new generation. And now Jesus goes up on the mountain and Matthew's making that parallel that Jesus is this figure like Moses who comes after Moses. Hear him as Moses commanded us. And so Jesus is going up on the mountain to give the law to the people of God. So the motif here is Moses in Deuteronomy Mm. speaking to the people. The people, yeah. So that helps us to understand, okay, so when we're reading Matthew chapter 7, when we're reading Matthew 22, Jesus is not talking to Christians. Jesus is talking to the covenant people of God at the time, which is the Jews. That's very, very important when we come to the scripture and understand what's being said here. Now, Brad, I want to talk about how a misunderstanding of this and what we just talked about a little bit ago with certain pastors that will teach it in a certain way where they apply it to us now in our context now as American evangelical Christians. How does that bring brokenness to us as Christians. Um, You definitely talked about the Galatian heresy. I do think when it comes to the law gospel paradigm, as we've talked about, which should undergird everything that we, in the way that we look at the Bible hermeneutically, it should undergird how we interpret scripture. Another thing that's interesting about that passage, and we talked about this earlier today, the people that he's talking to particularly are the covenant people of God, Israel, but he's warning them against false prophets. He's warning them against people that are telling them to basically live according to works. Mm -hmm. Warning them against those that tell them, follow the law and that's going to save you. That's really what he is trying to do here. The irony of it is that when we hear it preached in pulpits today, they do the exact opposite. (laughs) And they actually use a passage that is calling that kind of teaching out, but yet that's the kind of teaching that they inject into it. Yeah, it really is that kind of bizarre. It's that upside down because Jesus is not saying examine yourselves in this passage. He's saying examine the false prophets examine the false teachers. You'll know them by their fruits. Right. It's really interesting because if you go to Galatians, the fruit of legalism is harshness and biting and devouring one another. Love is not the fruit of legalism. Love is the fruit of the spirit. Love comes from the gospel. We love right. because we were first loved. And so what you end up seeing is, is harshness and biting and devouring. You see pride in every evil work. And, and well, so we start we being gather. suspicious of each other. We start looking at each other in the church. We look at ourselves because we're suspicious of ourselves. I, I might be a faker. And mm-hmm. then we start looking at everybody else. I find it very interesting because I can remember in my days in fundamentalism, it's almost like you go to church and you're like, oh, that one's a faker. Oh, that one's, Mm -hmm. it's like you're looking in the congregation trying to weed out all the fakers. You're not focused on Christ. 
<laughs> it's all focused upon quote unquote holy living, which again can be very ambiguous in the way that we even interpret it. It's very subjective. So we start looking at different people. And there's no edification happening. It's just suspicion, paranoia, calling people out, and not just looking to Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. Yes, the suspicion is going to be there when you turn inward, you become overly introspective, when the preaching goes heavy on the introspection and the self-examination without preaching Christ, when you get that sort of Christless Christianity and moralism, the suspicion is a natural fruit of that. But then when you inject it with this teaching that the elect are few, that the whole number of the elect is few, we naturally sort of apply our broader theological categories to our local context. So you're going to be in church questioning your salvation if you're honest or becoming puffed up if you're dishonest because you think you're actually pulling it off. But then this idea of the few exacerbates that. It's like pouring gasoline on the fire because you're going to go, I only expect what, 5% of this congregation is really regenerate? Well, the other 95% is fake. If you actually have that as a paradigm, then it makes sense why you're constantly trying to get that 95% saved, so to speak. Yeah, something you said to me is that this contributes to brokenness in the church because there's despair among the people who become convinced they are not among the few and pride among those who think they are. (laughs) It breaks the bruised reeds, which is the opposite of Christ's ministry, who will not break the bruised reeds, and it has a spirit of fear in it that is not from God. It turns people away from Christ to look at themselves, to see if they are one of the few, and thrusts them headlong into destruction. And that is Mm. so true. So true. Absolutely. This is pietism 101 right here, guys. Uh, I mean, we've, we've... You know, we had John Moffat on talking about pietism. This is pietism 101. And we become overly subjective. We become introspective. We emphasize private devotion, spiritual disciplines over the public gathering. It harms our understanding of ecclesiology, question and doubt, and we judge our brothers and sisters rather than spurring one another onto love and good works out of an overflow of the gospel. I mean, it not only denigrates the word of God, as you said, Brad, but you you also have said to me it denigrates the means of grace really the means of grace in the corporate gathering as we know as good reformed believers that's the primary means that god uses to sanctify us unto himself yeah and that's so key because you denigrate the visible church you assume most people aren't christians and then you don't link assurance to the lord's supper or to baptism or the preaching of the gospel you link assurance not to that objective christ for you outside of you but you link assurance to your performance where your performance happens primarily during the week outside of the local gathering and so you know the litmus test becomes did you get up early and read your bible you evangelize your co-workers and then you go to church to sort of show off or prove yourself that you're doing the things you're one of the few the emphasis becomes subjective it becomes on what i'm doing during the week that proves i'm one of the few and then when i go to church i'm not going to church primarily with the perspective of i need to receive from christ and i don't put a lot of stock in the public reading of scripture and in the preaching and teaching and the reception of the sacrament instead i'm looking to all my holy living during the week as my assurance and then that's going to naturally lead me to look around and compare myself among myself and be like are those people reading their bibles faithfully are those people evangelizing their co-workers Are those people doing family discipleship faithfully? You have all of these kind of spiritual disciplines and parachurch things that are become your litmus test for who's in, who's out. And it does. It just does create that default doubt mentality that we've talked about. Right. Where you just doubt that the people around you on Sunday morning are your brothers and sisters in Christ. So then pastorally, that's always lingering in the back of the pastor's mind. Is this person really a Christian? And while that could be a valid question, that question takes too high of a priority. And we assume, and again, the Bible says that love doesn't think evil, that it believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So we're called to patient endurance with one another, forbearing with one another in love. And instead of that model, this kind of produces the opposite of being short with others, 
being quick to judge, assuming evil, assuming the worst, not giving the benefit of the doubt. That creates a really unhealthy environment where people are either going to pretend or perform or hide, but they're not going to be able to be vulnerable about what's really going on in their life because if they admitted what was really going on, they would immediately be met with suspicion and doubt and told, you must not be one of the few. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about some historical Calvinist Baptist guys and some historical more reform guys that have had something to say on this particular topic. So I'm going to read a quote from Charles Spurgeon. He says, some narrow minded bigots. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) Think that heaven will be a very small place where there will be a very few people who went to their chapel or their church. I confess, I have no wish for a very small heaven and love to read the scriptures that there are many mansions in my father's house. How often do I hear people say, ah, straight is the gate and narrow is the way and few there be that find it. There will be very few in heaven. There will be most lost. My friend, I differ from you. Do you think that Christ will let the devil beat him? That he will let the devil have more in hell than there will be in heaven? No, it is impossible For then Satan would laugh at Christ. There will be more in heaven than there are among the lost. God says that there will be a number that no man can number who will be saved. But he never says that there will be a number that no man can number that will be lost. (laughs) There will be a host beyond all count who will get into heaven. That's C.H. Spurgeon. So, brother, are there going to be many saved or few saved? (laughs) There will be many. If Spurgeon's right which, of course, we, we would wholeheartedly agree with him on this point. And let me Where ask you this. Most. Why would we agree with him scripturally? So that's a really great point. Scripturally, the reason why we agree with Spurgeon is because of the Abrahamic covenant and blessing and promise. So if you go back to Genesis, God tells Abraham, you will be a father of many nations. And he promises that Abraham's offspring will be more than the stars in the sky, than the sands on the seashore. You can't number the grain of sands on the seashore. You can't number the stars in the sky. And modern science has only shown us that more and more, that the stars are innumerable and not able to be counted. And so we see that in promise form in Abraham. God says, your promise offspring, in which we know those who are in Christ or Abraham's offspring heirs according to the promise per Paul and Galatians. In Romans 4, he says that the gospel results in Abraham being the father of many nations, the Gentiles through the gospel. So the gospel ministry of Christ is bringing the nations into God's blessing in accordance and fulfillment of Abraham's promise. And then in Revelation chapter 7, we read John's experience of witnessing the church in glory. And he says there was an innumerable multitude, which no man can number, who are gathered around the throne, worshiping the Lamb. So from Genesis to Revelation, we have God's promise and the vision of its fulfillment that there is this multitude that you can literally not number who are in Christ, who are gathered there, saved, uh, worshiping around the throne of God. That's the baseline for why we can't read the few and extrapolate it to the whole of the elect, because the Abrahamic promise refutes that all the way from Genesis to Revelation. Yeah. I really like this quote that you sent me from John Webster. He says, one thing we might do is to try day by day to grasp something, which is the simplest and yet the hardest thing for any of us to grasp, that the gospel is true. That growth in the Christian life is simply growth in seeing that the gospel is true. That flies in the face of pietism. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. I would like to say another thing that Brad sent me that I think is so good. He says, pastors, do not try to smoke out false converts, but let the weeds and the wheat grow together to the end and let God sort it out. We believe our brothers and sisters when they profess faith and confess Christ, and we disciple from a presupposition of comfort and trust rather than doubt, which leads to mutual edification. If someone is in a pattern of sin, we can warn them and help them to turn back to the Lord. We don't have to doubt and question their salvation. Rather, we use the gospel, as Paul does, as the grounds of the imperative. Be who you are in Christ. Put off the old, 
put on the new. And so we honor one another. And if someone departs from the faith, we believe them and warn them and treat them as an outsider and unbeliever, but still preach the gospel to them and urge them to repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ, the only mediator. We don't go around assuming and speculating, but believing and encouraging one another with gospel comfort, the comfort of Christ as Paul commands us. This doctrine produces hope, assurance, and comfort, which is a primary priority in pastoral ministry, as the prophet Isaiah declared, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. That's good. (laughs) That is really good. And that is the way that we should be speaking to one another. And another quote that I'd like to share from Martin Lloyd-Jones, he says, there is nothing new to say in the pulpit every Sunday. It is always the gospel. Good news of the gospel is what needs to be shared. Not holiness, not do this and live. We can't do it. Jesus already did it for us. You have to point them to Jesus. And to take a passage like we've just shared from Matthew and to turn it into some sort of holy living passage is just a bad way to interpret the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And as Brad has shared, there's so many ways that this can bring brokenness to us in our lives by causing us to become so overly introspective that we bite and devour one another. We're constantly looking at each other. When we're looking at each other and we're looking at ourselves, who are we not looking to, Brad? Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And I will tell you from my own personal experience, when we're looking to Christ, again, with my episode with Mike Abendroth recently, where he talked about the whole guilt, grace, gratitude paradigm, you know, when we understand that our assurance is solely based in Jesus Christ, and we have that guilt, grace, gratitude paradigm, we are serving Christ our Lord with thankfulness because we're already resting in what he's provided for us. Amen. You know, it's fascinating, too, because when you do preach holiness in the wrong way, what you end up doing is putting believers back under the law, because the implications of the teaching that we were discussing at the beginning is that if you don't live holy enough, you won't be finally justified. It's a real perversion of the law because it's a kind of first use of the law. Right. But the pedagogical use of the law, that what we might call the first use, is to lead us to Christ. Right. Right. But what they do is say, instead of using it to say, see, you do not keep God's law, therefore you need the Redeemer, the Mediator, they say, ooh, because you don't keep God's law, you don't have the Mediator. And that is very damaging and dangerous. Mm. And the other thing is, if I'm sitting in your congregation and I don't believe, what I most need is the gospel preached to me because hearing comes by faith and faith through the word of Christ. So sure, give me the first use of the law. Convict me of my sin and my right unholiness before a holy God that I have nowhere to stand, but then give me Jesus as the mediator, the redeemer. Yeah, give me the answer. Don't answer. Yeah. Don't just give me the question. Give me the answer. (laughs) Yeah. And so it's a really damaging thing to make believers doubt that they have a portion or interest in the mediator because they don't keep the law. The fact that we don't keep the law is meant to guide us to our interest in the mediator, not take it away. And that really is why this whole understanding of the law gospel distinction paradigm is so very important. And really understanding that first and third use of the law paradigm as well. I mean, we talked about this in my episode with Pat Abendroth, and he said categories, categories, categories. That's so important for us to understand categories as Christians. Mm -hmm. We are so good at flattening out the complexities of who God is and of what he's given us in his word. I think part of it is that we want the easy answers, right? We want the easy one, two, three, five steps to being a good father, the three steps to being a good husband, the 10 steps to being a good Christian. We want all those things. The thing we don't understand is that is useless. It's useless because you're never going to live up to it. What we need is we need Jesus. We need Jesus who lived for us and died for us and rose again for us. That's what we need. Amen. And one of the things that's also so tragic about the false teaching that we're discussing is that at its root, it's unbelief in the power and efficacy of the gospel. Totally. 
Yeah. Because you need, since the gospel isn't enough to get people to live holy, we need well, to bring, and it's not really guilt and law. Yeah, and it's not trusting in the sovereignty results. of God either. And exactly. the the thing that kills me is that some of these guys that say they adhere to the sovereignty of God, but yet they can't trust God for the souls of the people in their congregation. Yeah. Well, and I think, too, like I said, this idea of the few does kind of pour gasoline on the fire because when you do imbibe that misunderstanding, as I've already said, you end up looking at your congregation not as, okay, 99% is Christian and maybe there's 1% that isn't or maybe it's 80, 20 or something. We don't really have a percentage from Scripture to put on there. But we do have examples like Judas was one of the 12, for example. It wasn't like half the 12. Plus in the parable of the virgins, it was like 50-50. So we don't see a consistent theme that only one or a half are going to be saved, but we do see that by and large, most are saved. That's why we have the judgment of charity, like the preaching of the gospel, the administration of sacraments, the gathering of, of the public worship. The church is the theater of grace where people come to take refuge in Christ. So we should assume that people who are faithfully showing up on Sunday to rejoice in Christ and worship him together and receive his gifts are people who have a real interest in him, who have received him as their savior. And so when we have that judgment of charity and we realize we don't have to try to sort this out yet, we can leave it up to God, then we can be gracious and gentle towards the flock. And like you said already, if somebody does end up denying the faith, saying, you know, I just don't think Jesus is the Christ. I had a friend who did that or something along those lines where they deny the faith or they really do have flippant, high handed sin that they aren't willing to part with in spite of proper confrontation and stuff. If they leave the church and say, I don't believe this stuff, then okay, at that point, we can treat them like an unbeliever. But we just want to be really careful not to go around with suspicion. And that's why we're coming at it from this angle of the elect are an innumerable multitude and how this undergirds that comfort and assurance and that judgment of charity. So, you know, as I mentioned, scripture from Genesis to Revelation supports this. But another scriptural truth that the reformers, so Josh and I have both looked at a B.B. Warfield essay that's written on this topic, yeah. that argues the same thing. But one of the images in that is, he says, imagine that humanity is a tree. We should not imagine that the elect are like little twigs and leaves broken off that then Christ weaves into a, a wreath for his head while the whole tree is cut down and thrown into the fire. Rather, we should see that Christ is the redeemer of mankind, that he is, saves the tree. While it's still true that twigs and leaves are broken off that are reprobate, there's a sense in which we can say Jesus Christ is the redeemer of the human race, the savior of the world, because he has saved so many of us. And in his mm. incarnation, Incarnation and his work as the second and last Adam or the ultimate eschatological man, he has in himself brought humanity into glory and new creation, brought humanity in his incarnation and through his ascension into heaven where he intercedes in the presence of God for us. And so he has actually redeemed the human tree. That's a paradigm that's faithful to scripture, faithful to the reformed tradition that also helps us see like we go to all the nations proclaiming Christ and he is bringing them in to the fold such that in the end, when we get to glory, there will be such a glorious array of diverse humanity that we will say, truly, this is the savior of the world. Mm -hmm. This is the redeemer of mankind. Amen. Is there any tribe, tongue, nation, language or people that he has not redeemed? With right. his own blood? And the answer, of course, is no. He has saved us all. And so that's an important point, too. Like, he's a mighty savior, which is why Spurgeon says Satan would laugh at Jesus mm. if he only had a few Southern Baptists in heaven. Yeah. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, I hope that this first episode of Theology for the Broken Church has been encouraging to you. I hope we've answered the question, many are called, but few are chosen. Well, um, I, I, I believe we've answered the question. There's going to be an innumerable amount of believers in heaven. And that Spurgeon quote just really sums it up. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to post that as well as the B.B. Warfield article in the show notes, um, as well as some other resources where you can go and do your own study. We're not telling you you have to agree with us. We're not telling you that. 
But I would tell you, do your research, read up, think about it. Think about what we're proposing here, because we really do believe that this is a more historical, reformed, covenantal perspective, which is what we're all about here at the Broken Vessels podcast. And we've seen from our own experience and from very well-known pastors that preach this type of thing, we've seen the damage that it can cause and the stealing away of assurance. And again, as Brad said, the denigrating of both Christ's church, his means of grace, and really even his word. Mm -hmm. And so that's all that we're proposing. And we just ask you to just look into it, study it, think about it, pray about it, seek the Lord on it. These are not truths that we completely understood our whole lives either. It took us time to come to a point where we understood these things. But we want to share with you what God has helped us to understand. Brad, man, this has been great. It has been fun just talking about Jesus. (laughs) Amen. All right. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to thank you for joining us for Theology for the Broken Church with Brad and Josh and the Broken Vessels podcast. We'll uh, be doing this again at the end of June. And uh, we just want to thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.